you always been obsessed by music? Were there any other ambitions? Um, when I was very young, I wanted to be a pilot. Because when I was five, I had this girlfriend who was going to be a stewardess. Mm. <laughs> uh, and then, then when I was about seven, um, I went for one of the, the regular um, eye tests. And, you know, you, you get one of those cards with all the dots on, and you're supposed to see 56, and I could see 27. You know, one of those ones. So if you see the wrong numbers, then you've definitely got something wrong with your, your, your vision. And I'm just slightly red-green colorblind. Um, so, you know, I, I think I'm wearing... Blue, <laughs> a, 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 like a, a deep yellow. And it's not that bad. It's just that, just that you cannot. When you go red, green, colour blind, red and green are fairly important colours to people who try to wave down planes and things like that. <laughs> and, um, and I think they, they told me that, that being a pilot was definitely out. So I gave up on that. And I, that was about the same time that my mother and father bought me a radio and. Uh, Basically, all my other interests just disappeared once I had that radio. But they, did they regret that until you became a star? They had other hopes for you, of course. Oh, they, they regretted it for years and years. I spent my whole um, childhood between seven and about, well, really until the day that I got my co record contract, having rows with my parents, specifically my father, because um, um, he's not, not very musical, to put it mildly. And, and I don't suppose, I can't blame him. I mean, you know, he had no idea about, um, about what possibilities there were for me. And uh, he just looked at it as a very, very dodgy profession to want to go into. What about... Now, of course. Yes, now. Do they he go to your home and wait for the checks. The... <laughs> <laughs> He's great. He, he, he came round very, very, um, very dignified, with, with a lot of dignity. He, ju he just um, accepted that he'd been wrong and... Uh, mm. And you were not... And waited for the checks. Yeah. <laughs> what about your mother? I mean, did they actually go to the concerts? Oh, yeah. The, my, my mum and dad come to um, just about every concert. My mother is actually... Um, if it weren't for the fact that I, I suppose there's a there's a, a very there's a, a lot of pride in in seeing your son up on stage, I suppose if it weren't for that, I'd have probably um, had her uh, <coughs> committed after the first con concert. Because <laughs> she's like, she's amazing. She's so reserved, my mum. She's really quiet, really reserved, very English. And and yet the minute that, that the curtains part at one of our gigs, it's just like. She's down there at the front. She's like, I've, I've seen my mother being helped over barriers by security. <laughs> She's got a skirt caught, you know. She's halfway through a number, you can see this commotion going on halfway down the, the hall, and it's your mum trying to climb the barrier. <laughs> She's incredible. She's absolutely amazing. Oh, you can't beat her. You're 22 now, aren't you? You're, 22. You're immensely rich. What do you enjoy most about fame and fortune? Um, what do I enjoy the most? I think, really... More than anything, I enjoy um, the freedom. There are two things, I think, in, in life that give you freedom. One, one is success in your own particular field, and uh, one is money, obviously. And, and I've got no real regard for money past security and comfort. I mean, I'm not a buyer. I don't buy things. You know, I, if I can't wear it or I can't eat it, I'm not really that bothered. You know, that's, I have, I've got a small house. I'm not trying to sound like, you know, I'm very humble, but I've got a small house because it's all I need. Um, which I rent, actually. Everyone's telling me to buy, but I still rent. Oh, we must buy. Um, <laughs> and I basically don't spend money on, on anything but my, pro my profession. I mean, I love being able to put money back into what I do professionally. I hope that you do what you want to do in the future. You obviously will. You've got a mind of your own, and it's been very good to meet you. Thank, Thank you, very, you much, very much, George Michael. Unfortunately, Andrew at the time was racing in Monaco, and um, I was trying, to, I, was, I waited for two or three days. We were trying to get through to Andrew. Andrrew uh, hadn't left his number with anybody, which is fairly typical of Andrew. Mm -hmm. and, um, and basically, I had to release my press statement earlier than, than um, I talked to Andrew. So um, what happened was that um, the statement came across as something um, about me leaving. Andrew behind, as opposed to the management behind, which was really not the case. And Andrew and I are meeting up um, next week in Los Angeles to uh, record the last Wham! single. And the concert hopefully will go ahead. And, and basically there's absolutely no rift whatsoever between the two of us. It's just something that the press have been waiting for for so long. Mm. That so it'll be a um, summertime, gentle, amicable party. Yeah, I, I think basically we want to turn it all around. I mean, there's no point in trying to tell people that we're not splitting up, but... Mm. Um, I think it should be the most uh, amicable split in pop history if we do it properly.
It's interesting, isn't it? Um, and I'm sure you'll agree, it's an odd fact that, that pop stars, even internationally famous ones, can knock off world political crises off the front page. It's a funny business, isn't it? I find it quite sad that really it's, it, they, the, the, the papers have started to become much more like pop comics, you know? And although it's, it, it's, it, I, there's no way I will deny I enjoy being a star, there's a point where being a star becomes being um, an object of of uh, trivia really when all people want to write about you is um you know that you feed your cat regularly or that um that uh you pay your you paid your dancers three years ago 12 pounds 50 a night but you do feed your cat don't you oh i do absolutely <laughs> i mean it's not it's not that uh, i don't appreciate the things that have happened to me in the last three or four years i do but i i do find it very hard to come to terms with the fact that people have have formed this this um this image of me, which is basically based on, on the press's uh, speculations, because I don't mm. talk to the press. I haven't talked to the press since China. So you're generally, are you amazed by what is written about you? Um, I, I am quite amazed, Joe. I'm quite amazed and, and most of the time quite amused. I just, it's just a bit difficult to have to try and prove to everyone that you meet that you're not, you know, like, brain dead, because that's, that's the type of impression I think people have of me through the papers, you know. Let's talk about image building, though, because Cliff Richard was on this show last week and, and was talking about the way he built his image, which was actually before you were born. Um, <laughs> how, did, uh, how did you go about your image building? Um, well, it was, it was a strange process, actually. When, when we were um, initially uh, thrown into the spotlight, as they say, uh, we'd both just um, come from school about nine months before. Andrew was on the dole, and I was doing some, I was doing two part-time jobs. I, I said I was at the dole, on the dole at the time, because it was very trendy at the time to be on the dole. Yeah as far as the music press was concerned, so we were both, you know, doll boys. We then suddenly realised that we had to change, change that image, if you like to call it that, because we weren't really, we weren't really um, living normal lives anymore in terms of we weren't, you know, we weren't on the doll. We weren't um, going to pubs every night the way we had done before. There were certain restrictions that we had on ourselves and certain business things that we were doing every day of our lives, which had nothing to do with the people that, that um, were buying our records. So we thought, this is all getting a bit fake, which is when we went into this kind of, you know, whole suntan and mm. the, the kind of high gloss image, which again, it worked. And I think it was honest because, you know, we were filming in hot places and things like that. And we were wearing shorts and things like that. But, um, but two earrings, George, that's... Oh, the touring, the touring story is quite good, actually, because um, what happened was Andrew originally um, wore two earrings about two, three years before um, Wham! started. And my mum and dad didn't like Andrew very much, you see, because, you know, it's the typical story, you know, when you, go, when you get to about 12 or 13 at school and you suddenly realise that there are better things to do than homework or whatever. And uh, you start, you have the normal interest that 13, 14-year-old boys have. And, um, bicycles, things like bicycles, that. Bicycles, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, collecting football cards and things like yeah. that. And um, my dad said to me, you ever come home with two earrings, he said, and you'll be out that door, right? So my dad actually meant it. See, mm. he's Greek, my father, Greek Cypriot, and uh, I think he meant what he said. So I used to think, oh, well, one day, one day. And then eventually we got our record contract, and the day after we got our record contract, I went to Selfridges and had both my ears shot, you know. <laughs> and uh, I went home, like, you know, went through the door, kind of... Fear. And not, not a word was said. I think, he, I think he thought it was business, you know, once you had a record contract. <laughs> He's got three in his left nostril now and so oh, yeah. <laughs> I must say, the audiences, George, look, look terrified. Do they ever frighten you? They, they, they don't usually terrify me. I'm not terrified in front of my own audience because I like to think that if um, someone's forked out four or five quid to go and see you, then it's because they have bought your records or because because they want to see you. Um, you but know. then you do face <laughs> physical danger at times. Missiles and stuff. Yeah, well, um, they, they, I think that it's, it's funny, but, but the worst things that get thrown at you are thrown in, in perfectly with, with goodwill. You know, I mean, I, I experienced in, in America, there was, I think it was um, Philadelphia or San Francisco. We played one, one particular occasion. We played to about 13,000 people on the first American tour. And we were just getting pelted with objects. People were kind of so frantic to make some kind of contact or get some reaction that they just throw anything that they had in their pockets or on their person, right? And so you get like boots thrown at you and you get... <laughs> I saw, and one night this Duracell hit me like... <laughs> straight, straight between the eyes and I nearly fell over. And Andrew, Andrew actually stopped the band for a minute and, and you know, it was really strange to hear him saying, please, 
don't throw things at George, you know. It's like, <laughs> it's like you know, what have I done wrong? Kind of, but they basically, they just wanted some kind of reaction. They probably threw several batteries, but only the Duracell got Oh, these. yeah. 